بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. So you guys could probably tell my throat's not the best right now, but I pray that Allah Azza wa Jalla allows me to have a beneficial time with you, inshallah. And I, uh, I hope that you found what you've been through thus far to be beneficial and enriching with all of the wonderful speakers and teachers and mashayikh that you've had over the last couple of days. The topic that I have is uh, one of those topics. You walk into a convention, a conference, and there's usually this, can we be Muslim and can we be American? You know, uh, you hear the statement, my country is the country where I will bury my children, not the country that my parents were buried in or where I came from, and all of these types of things. And one of the things about belonging and the feeling of belonging and not being turned into any type of foreign element is that if you have to insist on belonging, that's a good sign that you don't feel like you actually do belong. Meaning if you reinforce your otherness by talking about we are proud Muslims and we are proud Americans and you keep on saying it and you keep on saying we belong here and this is our home, usually there's actually something creeping in on the inside that's not that subtle anymore or not that subtle in our speeches about how you actually feel uh, like you don't really belong. And it's important to fight through that. Now we wanna talk about what it means to be constructively engaged, constructively engaged. And I did want this to take um, a different turn because I think there's a very familiar way of discussing this topic. And then I'd like us to discuss it more with our vision on the future and the trend of nation state and what this topic is gonna to mean in 10 years. Because if you haven't noticed, the world is rapidly changing. Ideas of patriotism are rapidly changing. There is a rise, a global rise in fascism, and that's not coincidental. And as much as I can't stand Donald Trump, he's not the only person to blame for this. There's a rise of fascism and nationalism around the world, and that is the culmination of multiple factors, right? And that's going to have implications for a very long time. This is not just something that you vote out in one election and then you move on. This is something that, and that's not to say don't vote and uh, you know and all that stuff. No, vote and be constructive and be engaged in all of that. That's important. And inshallah ta'ala, you know, we, we do our part uh, to usher in positive change. But this is no longer about one country. And if there's anything that you could see is that in the insistence on America first as a platform, in Germany on Germany first as a platform, the campaign of Le Pen in France and France first, or in the UK of, you know, that this is about the United Kingdom first, there's actually a connection between all of these global fascist movements. So it's actually not America first or uh, London first or the United Kingdom first or France first or Germany first or whatever it is that this is taking place, this horrific rise of white nationalism. It's about something else. It is about global dominance, but it's about ushering in a different type of dominance and a different type of a transnational relationship between movements. Steve Bannon, who operationalized white supremacy in the United States, you know, with Breitbart and other methods, got Donald, or in, 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 in many ways is responsible for the election of Donald Trump, is going on these European tours, speaking in different countries about how they can take it back. The eerie connection between not just Netanyahu and Trump and what's happening to the Palestinians and you know, uh, the far right uh, parties in, uh, in Israel and here, but Modi, why in the world is Hindu fascism so well connected to white nationalism in America and to right-wing Zionism in Israel? Like, what is it about them that they're literally studying a playbook? Now, it would be silly for us to discuss patriotism and to discuss you know, our role towards a country without taking note of this phenomenon and sort of planning around it. So going through the familiar route first, the familiar route of this is as follows, that no matter where the Muslim goes, the Muslim is constructive. The Muslim brings khair, brings goodness to everything and everyone around them. If the Muslim is not benefiting the people around them then the Muslim is not living their Islam in the fullest sense. 
That's the familiar route and that's the most important fundamental part of this. Islam is not just meant to be insular or for a community to hold on to, to resist the changes of the world around it. Islam is meant to activate us to be positive agents for change in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our regions, in our countries, in our world. We did not send you except as a mercy to the world. In the khayr nas and fa'uhum nas where the Prophet says, the best of people are those who are most beneficial to the people. In no way do you ever see a qualification. And a lot of times when people are asking about prioritizing what you do for people here or what you do for over there, what they're really asking is, you know, can I give sadaqa to non-Muslims? Like, is it really, do I really need to put into, you know, feed the homeless programs here and cleaning up here where I could put that money somewhere else in a Muslim country? Don't they have a greater right upon me? Isn't it gonna do so much more if I put it towards there? So there's a disconnect that we feel from our environment. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this tree of faith that offers shade to everything around it. Asluha thabit wa far'uha fis sama tu'ti ukulaha kulla heena bi'idni rabbiha. This tree of faith that shades everything around it. That means that if you are not benefiting your environment, there's a deficiency in your lived Islam. If you're not benefiting your environment, there's a deficiency in your lived Islam. That's true as an individual, that's true as a community. That's true as an individual and that's true as a community. I'm not doing something right if my environment is not experiencing my Islam in a positive way. The narrations about the Salaf, about the pious predecessors could fill entire pages of books and they do. Those scattered, they do. Starts with the Prophet ﷺ himself. It goes to Abu Bakr anhu as he was being run out of Mecca on his way to Abyssinia. Imagine how much the trajectory of history changes if Abu Bakr anhu went to Habasha, went to Abyssinia, did not accompany the Prophet ﷺ on the way to Medina. What stopped him on his way out to Abyssinia to migrate? A non-Muslim chief stopped him and told him, مِثْلُكَ يَا أَبَا بَكِرْ لَا يُرَدْ a person like you, O Abu Bakr, should not be turned out. And in some narrations, لا يخرج ولا يخرج. That person should not leave, be forced to leave, nor should they be allowed to leave. Meaning if, if a person like Abu Bakr decided that he wanted to leave society, then as a society we should rally around and make him an offer that he can't refuse to keep him here because he's too beneficial here. We can't let Abu Bakr go and takes Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu wa ta'afa ala ashrafi Quraysh and goes to the leaders of Quraysh and says, this man, Abu Bakr, are you people crazy? Do you not see what Abu Bakr has done for you in Mecca? The presence that Abu Bakr has had in Mecca? You're gonna let a man like this go? And he said, he's under my protection. Not because of the tie of Iman, he didn't have faith, but he saw the fruits he was experiencing the fruits of Abu Bakr's Iman. He didn't have Iman, but he was experiencing the fruits of Abu Bakr's Iman. Therefore, he wanted Abu Bakr to remain in Mecca. The story of Abdullah ibn Mubarak radiallahu ta'ala anhu, great scholar, uh, and his Jewish neighbor who put a premium on his house, said he would sell his house for twice the price because Abu ba Abdullah ibn Mubarak would be your neighbor. And he's a man who just showed incredible benevolence to his neighbor, to his Jewish neighbor. This is stuff you can't make up. He literally said, I'd have to charge, I'm not giving up, the, it's not just the house, it's not the bricks. It's the shade of the Iman of Abdullah ibn Mubarak that's extending over my house. The fruits of that faith, the shade of that faith and the fruit, fruits of that faith. I can't let this guy go. Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, when he, was a, when he was passing away and the Christian priest came to him and told him that your life was a benefit, not just to the Muslims, but it was, it was a benefit, it was comfort for all of us. We all benefited from your presence. SubhanAllah, that's incredible, right? So it stretches throughout Islamic history, these people that with the fruits and shade of their Iman, shaded and, and provided for everything around them. And that's the most fundamental element of this in terms of commitment, in terms of conduct, in terms of this idea of the Muslim bringing khair, to everyone, bringing goodness to everyone. Now, what does that mean for your country? Specifically, your country. 
with the nation state model as it is, this is already a very different uh, type of world arrangement than we're used to in past history. So we have to use Qiyas, we've got to use analogy, right? What makes a person, I live in Texas, border state. Does a person in El Paso, Texas, have a greater haq on me, a greater right on me, than the person in Juarez, Mexico, five miles away, because of a border? It's really, these, are, these are serious intellectual questions. If I'm Saudi, right? Does a person that lives on the border of Yemen have a right, a greater right upon me than the person who lives in Yemen? Wherever I am, right? <clears throat> Wherever I am, does, do these nation states actually have meaningful consequences to what right someone has upon me. This is really interesting and I'll tell you why. Because when you look in Islamic history or in the books of Tuskia, you'll find distinction based upon the following. Number one, who has authority over you? Political authority over you. So that's one way of drawing a net, right? Are we bounded by a political authority? So in that sense, the person in El Paso, I'm not saying has a greater right upon me, but is bounded to me by something that the person in Juarez is not. Humanity, the same. Love, compassion, all that the same. But we're bounded by a single political authority, right? So that's one way of looking at it, the way you interact with political authority. And then you have the immediate, right? You have the jar, haq al jar, the rights of the neighbors. Typically, the ulama drew the rights of the neighbors to uh, to nets that were based upon al-ma'roof, that were based upon what was customary. So you'll find books of fiqh that will say, your neighbor that's seven houses to your right, seven houses to your left, seven in front of you, seven behind you. They use the number seven. When they used qiyas over the number of tawaf, the number of sa'i, they said the number seven is just a logical number. But what does that mean if you live in a condo, right? And you've got you're in a building and you got 20 neighbors all to your right and left, 10 on each side, right? What does that mean, right? So the idea is that these are things bil ma'roof. These are things that are customary, but there's haq al jar. Where it gets tricky is after family and neighbors and immediacy. What about your qawm, your people? And what does your people mean? And what about your ummah? What about your nation, as in your Muslim brothers and sisters? And is there a tension? in my allegiance to my ummah and my allegiance to my qawm, does my allegiance to my ummah stop me from being the best person I can be to my qawm, to my people? And does my allegiance to my qawm stop me from having the fullness of being a constructive citizen of the human race? Right, so think about it this way. Ummah, if I'm dedicated and loyal to my ummah, what does that mean for my qawm? What does that mean for my people that are not part of my ummah? And if I'm dedicated and loyal to my qawm, to my people, what does that mean for people, for Bani Adam, for the children of Adam, humanity? And I'll tell you why this is important to discuss within our political circumstances, okay? Number one, <clears throat> the borders between us over these next few years are going to become even more superficial than they are now. Why? You have a financial system that's becoming further derelegated. You have, a, uh, uh, you, you have social media and technology that's becoming an autonomous beast on its own, right? You have all of this exposure, hyper exposure to one another. And so what you really have happening right now are distinctions that are based upon wealth and based upon privilege. Distinctions that are based upon wealth and based upon privilege. And so you have this human catastrophe that's looming over us right now, where the wealth gap is greater than it's ever been. And so, you know, the elites, I'm not trying to go Bernie Sanders on y'all, all right? And I don't have the throat to go Bernie on you guys right now, okay? But you know, you've got, you've got people that belong to elite classes, whether of power or wealth, that have increasing allegiance to one another, that protect each other's interests. And so the elite power or, uh, or, or wealthy in a Muslim country 
is far more concerned about protecting the elite and powerful class that serve as trading partners in, in the West than they are their Muslim brothers and sisters that are Uyghurs or in Kashmir. They don't care. You know, so the thing is, is that the distinctions are becoming drawn out more on the lines of power than nation and state and any type of actual allegiance to a people. What this means for us is that we have to examine this discussion um, considering the rise of nationalism and the superficiality. And let me tell you why it gets so important. If you really, really want to upset me, like you really, really, really want to get me mad, all right? You'll walk up to me at a conference and you'll talk about how, you know, I'm pro-immigration enforcement. What's wrong with the wall at the border? And of course, people should not be free to come. And it's like, where did you come from again? Where did your parents come from? And you speak with white privilege and you're not even white, you know, and like, it's a really weird thought, but like, you know, well, we can't have a free-for-all, you know, we can't have people just come, you, you spout these crazy talking points. And you talk about it from a sense of entitlement. My parents did it the right way, or I did it the right way. I came here the way that I should have. Those people deserve to be caged at the border. They should have went about it the right way. Completely ignoring circumstances, completely ignoring detrimental American foreign policy, completely ignore, ignoring humanitarianism, completely ignoring your own circumstances and why you were allowed in versus someone else who might be in a place that actually was stolen from them. I mean, completely ignoring everything. And then you want people to be sympathetic to Muslim causes. Then you want to talk to that person about Palestine or talk to them about Kashmir or talk to them about something else. Like, really? Who gave you the right? I say, well, Islam is not about anarchy. Who said Islam is about anarchy? Right? And so we start to operate on very basic, flawed assumptions. Very strange understandings of the nation state and that place in Islam. And then you start using Islamic arguments to justify Republican immigration policy. And it's like, what? About Ta'at Wali Al-Amr. I've heard that one before. You know, obey the authority and doing things the right way and being anti-anarchy and doing, you know, all these notions of citizenship that you construct from Islamic texts that have nothing to do with our world today. And so here's how we got to bring this back. Number one, we start with defining things properly. Is there an authentic definition of ummah, an authentic definition of qawm that exists in our time today? And what does that, what are the implications that that has for us um, today? Ummah is very self-explanatory. Everyone in here knows what the ummah is, right? It is the unity that Muslims around the world are supposed to have, right? It is my brothers, my sisters that share the same faith. I feel a connection, a sense of ghira and honor and, and, and connectedness to every single Muslim in the world. Whether that Muslim is in Somalia or that Muslim is in China or that Muslim is in... Uh, Bosnia, I feel a deep connection to every single Muslim around the world. And by the way, it is highly Islamophobic, highly Islamophobic when Muslims are the only people that are not allowed to talk about transnational unity together without it being looked at as some global extremist Islamist conspiracy to take over the world. That's very Islamophobic. Every other faith community is allowed to talk about what it looks like to be bounded across borders and to have unifying causes sometimes that are overtly political. Why is it that Muslims can't talk about unity across borders and talk about what that means and how, 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 you, how you, uh, you, you connect that, how you maintain that? Why is it that Muslims are not able to talk about that? Because that immediately denotes takeover and uh, subjugation of other people, of other faiths. And, that's your notion of Islam, not my notion of Islam. So yes, I have a connection to every single Muslim in the world. 
I feel deeply connected to every single Muslim in the world. That's my ummah. Then you have the word qawm. And the word qawm is an interesting word, people. I'll tell you why. The Prophet ﷺ, when he was being attacked in Uhud, and he says, Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, forgive my people because they don't know any better. When the Prophet ﷺ is saying that, he's not talking about the people on his side. He's not talking about Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali. He's talking about the people on the other side. He's talking about the people that are attacking him, that came from Mecca, and that he still felt a connection to. And he still attributed to himself, Oh Allah, forgive my people, my people. Now you can imagine that that could cause some tension with the Sahaba. What do you mean, my people? And we make a big mistake, by the way, when someone converts to Islam, and sometimes we fill their head with all sorts of nonsense, make them feel like they can no longer really meaningfully be a part of their family, and then get mad when they talk about convert isolation and marginalization in Muslim communities, and then just come at them because how dare you say Merry Christmas to your non-Muslim relatives, you became Muslim two months ago. All that stuff, right? That connection is a natural connection. Family, people, my people, my qawm. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ still felt that with his people in Mecca. He still felt that connection to them. He still made dua for them. He still prayed for them. Now the word qawm, linguistically by the way, some of the scholars or some people talk about qawm, they said uh, qawm refers to the leadership of a people. Okay? Qama uh, yaqumu, these are people that are in authority. Okay? From amongst the people. Some of them uh, talked about uh, qawm as excluding the women. Some of them talked about qawm because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hujurat, لا يسخر قوم من قوم عسى أن يكونوا خير منهم ولا نساء من نساء Okay, let not one group of people mock another group of people. Let not one group of women mock another group of women. So some defined it by uh, gender. Some defined it by tribe. They said, أي من جد واحد That there is a similar Grandfather, there is a, a connection through lineage. So a qawm is someone that's your fifth cousin, but you share some sort of an ancestor that you can all trace back to. Well, then we're all part of the qawm of Adam, alayhi salam, right? We're all part of Bani Adam, but they said min jaddin wahid, or they define it in terms of nasl. And if you look at the word itself, it's actually a lot more general than that. It is anything that bounds a people, whether you share language or culture or are bounded by a singular political authority but you feel a connection to that group of people or you're bounded by some sort of social contract political or otherwise you can at least take the the rulings from that sense they become your home these are my people okay now is it okay to love your land is it okay to love the place that you came from how many of you are from chicago how many of you were born in Chicago? So you can't like do that whole woohoo thing over here because you're in Chicago. That's only if there are people from another city in here that you guys get to cheer on your own, right? So a lot of you are from Chicago. How many of you were born in the United States? Okay, the majority of you were born in the United States, right? Now, do I feel a connection to my city over my state, my state over my country, what is it? The reality is, is that that's very subjective. It goes back to, land, it goes back to the person, the individual. It's very touching when you read the Prophet wasallam as he's leaving Mecca. When the Prophet wasallam uh, was leaving Mecca, and there are two narrations, and I'll read both of them uh, for a reason. The first one, the Prophet wasallam said, مَا أَطْيَبَكِ مِنْ بَلَدْ What a blessed land you are. وَأَحَبَّكِ إِلَيَّ مَا أَطْيَبَكِ مِنْ بَلَدْ وَأَحَبَّكِ إِلَيَّ What a blessed land you are and what a beloved place you are to me. وَلَوْلَا أَنَّ قَوْمِ أَخْرَجُونِي مِنْكِ مَا سَكَنْتُ غَيْرَكِ Had it not been that your people would have run me out, I would have never lived in a different place. I would have always stayed here. That's one way, right? Now, in another narration, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam iltafata ila Mecca, faqal, "Anti ahabu biladillah ila Allah, 
he turned back to Mecca and he said to Mecca, you are the most beloved of places to Allah. وَأَنْتِ أَحَبُّ بِلَادِ اللَّهِ إِلَيَّ And you are the most beloved of places to me. فَلَوْ أَنَّ الْمُشْرِكِينَ لَمْ يَخْرُجُونِي لَمْ أَخْرُجُ مِنْكِ The Prophet ﷺ said, had it not been for the mushrikeen, for the, uh, the disbelievers running me out, I would have never left you. Now, the reason why the second narration is important is because the Prophet ﷺ makes a distinction. He doesn't just love Mecca because Allah loves it. He loves it himself. It's his homeland. It's the place that he grew up in. The Prophet ﷺ barely left Mecca growing up. He had an attachment to it. The Sahaba had an attachment to it. You go to, how many of you have been to Mecca and Medina? Okay. Where was nicer, Medina or Mecca? Medina, you got palm trees, you got water, you got greenery. Mecca, you've got a clock and some really good halal burger places. And other than the haram, it's pretty much it. It's rough, it's stone, it's, there's nothing. Allah really made sure that no one would go to Mecca for anything but the haram. No beaches, there's nothing to see there. Right? You're going for the Kaaba, you're going for the Haram, and that's it. There is no other reason why you'd possibly want to go to Mecca. Unless you got family there, right? Uh, no offense to, do we have some Maccawis here? I'm sorry. I apologize. Can you tell me and the crowd something nice about Mecca that we don't know about? The food. The food is delicious. Grown from the palm trees. Tamar Mecca, ya Sheikh. The dates of Mecca. Now I'm be roasting Mecca. Yakfik and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala li Mecca anti ahabu biladillahi ilayya. That's good enough for you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, You're the most beloved place in the world to me. But let's also be real. No water, no nature, weather's not all that great. I didn't see that one coming. <clears throat> you guys have surveys on these talks? Comments. He insulted Mecca. <laughs> Medina, geographically, nature-wise, has more to it. But when the Sahaba went from Mecca to Medina, the Muhajirin went from Mecca to Medina, they hated the place. They thought the water was disgusting. Tell them palm trees, what palm trees? Tell them how nice it is, grass, greenery. They hated Medina because it wasn't home. You have a connection to home, all right? I'm from New Orleans. If you go to New Orleans and start telling me about how some places were run down, I will be very upset because it's home. I love it. It's just home, all right? I'll acknowledge it. The point is, it's home. You love home. You love the place that you were born and raised. There's familiarity. There are memories. There's childhood. There's a connection. And it's okay to feel that connection. It's fitri. It's natural, it's human nature. The Prophet ﷺ felt that connection. That's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing. So here's what it actually comes down to when you start talking about what this is going to mean in the world around us and when you talk about boundaries and when you talk about nation state and when you talk about the development of the modern world and you talk about ummah and qawm and these types of things. When someone loves their brother or their sister or loves their family, no one looks at that as a threat to the cohesion of society. If anything, people talk about the strengthening of bonds in the family and the strengthening of the family units as core to a healthy and harmonious society. When you talk about the strengthening of a community coming together, that should not be to the detriment of everyone else. Likewise, by the way, it's important for us as Muslims to be able to love our ummah and still love our qawm and to be able to love our qawm and still love humanity and not let superficial nation-state boundaries see one group of people as more human than others. And here's what belonging actually means and what it means to bring taqwa. See, there's been a conflation of patriotism and nationalism and this is happening around the world. Nationalism speaks more to loyalty. Patriotism is to love a 
to love your people and to love a place enough that you want to reform it for the better. You want to make it the best it can possibly be, right? Nationalism is loyalty. I have to be loyal to it. I can't question it, all right? As Muslims, sometimes, in the desire to show our Americanness, we shy away from questioning America and questioning particularly American exceptionalism. American exceptionalism is a global problem that has led to the detriment of the Muslim world, which is the reason why, or one of the reasons why, you had a large Muslim immigrant population here in the first place, was because of the sinking of other societies due to American exceptionalism. This idea that this nation deserves to live in peace while others don't, this idea that casualties at home are more severe on the human conscience than casualties in Afghanistan or Iraq is a serious problem. And so your belonging and your expressing love and patriotism and being connected to people should not allow you to swallow the version of Americanness that nationalism dictates, but another version of it, right? Which is that I can love my ummah, but my love for my ummah will not cause me to wrong someone who doesn't belong to it. I can love my home. I can be a proud American. I can be proud of my city, proud of my state. I can feel a great connection to that. But at the same time, that cannot blind me to what exists of humanity, right? And, and, and what happens in humanity to a global sense. As the world becomes more global now, See, nationalism right now, and, and by the way, the fact that nationalism is experiencing such a global resurgence is actually, and I'm a political history major, is actually a sign of its decline. It's inevitable death, inshallah ta'ala. It's kind of the last, uh, the last breaths of it comes back, resurges, is having like a World War II resurgence. Think about a dying person with that... <gasps> That last gasp, that's what we're witnessing right now. It's going to die, inshallah ta'ala, and these, we're going to have to deal with new problems. Okay? We're going to have to deal with entirely different problems that are going to be posed to us by the way that the world develops, you know, uh, in, in, in technology and other ways that really break down the borders. But being a global citizen as well, being a global citizen as well, that's something that's extremely important. What it comes down to is the Muslim does not distinguish in their sadaqa, in their charity, and in their charitable being between anyone in front of them. But here's the thing. Should I find a way to connect myself to the people that come from the same land as me, the people that speak the same language as me, people that like the same food as me, people that belong to the same tribe and that extended family? Absolutely. Islam teaches you to develop a human connection on whatever basis you possibly can. If you can connect with someone because you're from the same town and that causes you to feel a, a love for them and causes you to bond, gives an opening for you to channel your khayr towards them, to channel your good towards them, alhamdulillah, good. Whatever the bond that's being created is through language, culture, uh, a common ancestor, a common land, use that for good. But what this translates into, and I'll conclude with this thought, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the lowest branch of faith is what? Can anyone tell me what the lowest branch of Iman is? The lowest branch of faith. <laughs> to remove something harmful from the road. <laughs> the highest branch of faith is Tawheed. Is la ilaha Allah. The lowest branch of faith is to remove something harmful from the road. What does that translate into in terms of policy? Think about that. That means that cleaner streets, by the way, adha, adha is very interesting because adha is the lowest form of harm. Adha could be noise pollution. Adha is something that doesn't, you know, imatatul adha an tariq is not removing something that's causing cars to flip over. Imatatul adha an tariq is picking up a Coke can. 
because adha is an annoyance, okay? What does that translate into, into cleaner environment? As a matter of faith. Isn't that amazing? It's a matter of iman, a matter of faith for me to contribute to a cleaner environment. So what does that matter of faith mean in terms of policy to the betterment of my own and to the betterment of humanity as a whole? And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us productive members of our ummah, productive members of our cities and our societies and our countries, and productive members of our humanity. Allahumma ameen. And inshallah ta'ala, I'll go ahead and I'll take questions now. Jazakumullah khair. What is your advice to those who work in the humanities sector to maintain their own spirituality and deen? And how do you treat the desensitization to what we see? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, he saw some people that came from Yemen to accept Islam and they, they asked for the Qur'an to be recited. The Qur'an was read, Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr said, Hakadha kunna qabla an qasat qulubna. That's how we used to be before our hearts became hard. We used to hear the Qur'an and it would immediately bring us to tears. Abu Bakr said that. Because it's natural, it's not the same anymore. Right? So you shouldn't attribute it to a dead heart. You shouldn't say that this is Allah punishing you. You should still try to increase capacity, still try to cry. But at the same time, realize it's a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He's given you uh, the ability to do more. And in some ways, that numbness sometimes can be a rahmah. You need to activate it though to say, how do I build capacity? Two things that are very important here, and it's just, it, it, it seems rudimentary, but it's it's extremely important. And I see Sheikh Suhail in the Khalil Center. You gotta help me out here, man. You gotta give like some, Sister Lubna, I see you here too. We need like some practical tips here, and I'm, I might not be the best one. So maybe in the, in the, in the maybe later on tonight in the Q&A, if you have some additional thoughts, inshallah, you can share, because I, this is very important about coping with emotions. I'll just tell you this, two things. Um, Number one, your goal is to be the most capable abd of Allah, the most capable slave of God and khadim and servant to humanity. Therefore, anything you do to make you a more capable abd of Allah and a more capable khadim of humanity is ibadah, is an act of worship in and of itself. Meaning when I take a break and I do it for the sake of for the sake of building myself to have to be a better person, to be a more full person, that leisure, that time off, that relaxation, that counseling, that kicking back, that all of that is ibadah. It's an act of worship because I'm doing it with the intention of making me fuller so I can give more. It's the same way when you want to earn wealth to spend it for the sake of Allah. Every moment of that earning is ibadah. It's not just spending that sadaqah. It's the earning itself that becomes rewarded as well. The same way when you sleep so that you can wake up and you can be energetic and do good things. So when you take breaks and when you do things that are important to your own mental health and emotional health and, and well-being so you can be a better abd and a better khadim, that is ibadah. That's just as important because you're not going to be useful if you're going to burn yourself out and not be able to help anyone anymore or do anything else anymore. So take the, don't feel guilty for taking those breaks and doing those things that are necessary. See them with the goal of ibadah, that this is part of my worship, that I'm going to do this, inshallah, so I can be a better, a better at this. The second thing is the role of prayer and the role of actually filling your spiritual tank, your spiritual reservoir. When you get up and you pray Qiyam al-Layl and you make dua for your brothers and sisters, it's incredibly liberating as well. Because you don't view your dua and your qiyam as a, futile, as, as a futile experience, as just something that's meaningless. You view it as part of the change. And I'm telling you, you can't divorce spirituality from activism. If you do, you're going to burn out either spiritually or in your activism. Both of them need each other. <laughs> They've got to be paired off. And this is one notion of spirituality. My dua is meaningful. My dua is meaningful. You're putting your trust in the one who can change things. You're putting your trust in the one who has power that I don't have. You're putting your trust there. Salam tu amri wa amruhum lillah. 
I'm entrusting my affairs and the affairs of them to Allah. But I'm going to keep doing what Allah tasks me to do for them. But I'm putting it all to Allah. Right? It's liberating spiritually. It's liberating mentally. It's, and it's not some sort of placebo effect. Like it's real. This is a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The process of that, you do good for them and you refill your own spiritual tank. You wake up energized. You wake up ready to go. You need that spiritual regimen. Don't ever let shaitan fool you and tell you that if you do enough sadaqah and enough khidmah, you no longer need dhikr and salah. And don't ever let shaitan fool you into thinking that if you do salah and dhikr, you don't have to do the other stuff. That's all for those weird people out there. Spirituality and activism are married to each other. You divorce them from each other, both will suffer. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to build our capacity and to help us build uh, capacity so that we can be more capable in our ibadah to him and more capable in our khidmah to the people. What should the Muslim stance be on gun violence and standing in regards to the Second Amendment rights? <laughs> what does Islam have to say about the Second Amendment? Um, Kids shouldn't be shot in schools, that, that we have an epidemic in our country, and that anything constructive to solve that should be explored. Um, this, you know, this is where Islamic values are, um, are important in the abstract sense, and then it allows us to work in policy in accordance with that. Um, the only time America ever passes gun reforms is when the wrong people have guns. So the only time, does anyone know when America, the only time America has ever passed gun reform legislation, does anyone know? The Black Panthers got guns in California because black people are not supposed to have guns. They're not supposed to be defending themselves. It's a tricky, tricky, tricky discussion. I share with you the experience and you draw from it what you want. In Dallas, Texas, we had these white supremacists constantly protesting in front of our masjids with their big AR rifles. They chose to go to the Nation of Islam temple and to uh, a masjid in the inner city. And you know what? That community said, bring it on. They came out and they stood in front of their masjids with their guns. That group came and they were out in five minutes, never went back to either place. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean that we should be encouraging Muslims to hold guns in front of masjids? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not encouraging that. I'm just saying that there was something about that, that that should give us pause, right? So where's the balance here that we find between self-defense, which they were doing, self-defense. And I remember being really annoyed at the ISNA convention last year where, um, and it's nothing on ISNA, by the way, but uh, there was a white supremacist group that came out Friday, and then on Saturday, uh, the Black Panther Party came out to defend the Muslims, and the Muslims spent more time blasting the Black Panther Party than they did the white supremacist group that was there in the first place. It's like, no, we're giving them roses, and we're making... And I was like, something here is not right, okay? Here's the thing about this, the Second Amendment discussion. You can talk about what's happening, um, you know, in the country. You can talk about the nonsense of it. You can talk about the culture of violence. You can talk about meaningful gun legislation that will also contribute to solving the problem. You can talk about the NRA, which by the way is like a, it's idolatry. SubhanAllah, these people worship their guns. I had a friend of mine who secretly became a member of the NRA uh, just to kind of get the emails and kind of follow. It was like a mole in the NRA. And he was like, show me this stuff. It is like worship. It's crazy. It's a weird thing in that, in the, in that whole lobby, right? The gun lobby. You can talk about the NRA. You can talk about the idea of the Second Amendment, can you imagine the Second Amendment, right? And, and a lot of times we talk about constitutional rights and talk about reform and don't offend the Constitution. What does that say about our country when the Second Amendment of the Constitution has to deal with holding guns and bearing arms? Like our culture, right? And by the way, we can critique, again, political science, political history, compare the Constitution of the United States of America to the Constitution of South Africa and you'll notice priorities being very different, right? So why is it such a priority there? So I think we talk about meaningful 
gun reform legislation, we talk about some of the, the looming issues outside of guns, where it's not just guns, but there is something to do with guns, because obviously guns are killing people. We can talk about um, all of these things, and we can frame them in Islamic values uh, without attaching Islam to the very specific legislation, just the idea of safety, the idea of harmony, the idea of, 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 uh, of, of societal cohesion and things of that sort, and not have to address the specifics within the Islam, or, or uh, identify a very specific thing to an Islamic context. Uh, I hope that wasn't too much rambling, but the point is that it's abstract talk about ideas and not necessarily the specifics here on, on some of these things. One last question and we'll break for Maghrib, inshallah. Um, two parts, is there, are there any credible charities that someone can give to help our Muslims, our Muslim brothers and sisters in China? And is dua a form of activism? So the first thing is we gotta get our terminology right. Um, uh, the Uyghurs are an occupied people. East Turkestan, it's not China. So we have to get the terminology right. The Uyghurs are a people that were robbed of their autonomy, they were robbed, they are an occupied people, they are a people that um, have their identity being stolen from them. Not just their religious identity, their culture and everything that comes with it. Okay, so that's the first thing. So they're not Muslims necessarily in China. Um, though that is the current political reality, but that's not the way that it's supposed to be. These are people that are being, uh, you know, um, being murdered and being interned and being put in the concentration camps to a place of conformity with the attempt to destroy not, their, not just their religion, but their political autonomy, their culture, and everything that comes with it. Um, there's a legitimate I think there are legitimate charitable ways to get money to the Uyghur refugees. There are tens of thousands of them in Turkey right now. Uh, you have an answer to that question, what the, what's the way to get the, the money to them, by the way? No? I was looking your way just because you seemed to. <laughs> what's that? There are ways. Okay. So I, I know that there, I mean, there are, there are refugees there. Yeah, inshallah. So... Hopefully we can figure it out, right? Because I think a lot of people are thinking about how to get money to the Uyghurs that are in Turkey um, and in different places. So there are Uyghur refugee settlements in different places. Um, and I think we should try to explore those things, inshallah. But by the way, the pressure is important and the pressure is working, inshallah ta'ala. So keep the pressure up. Um, keep raising your voice. Rather than yours. Um, the Chinese government, unfortunately, is responding with worse crackdowns, uh, more oppression. But if there was any hope of getting Muslim countries to grow a spine and to do something, that should have gone down the drain when those Muslim countries actually signed the letter to the United Nations, sanctioning the treatment of the Uyghurs, using, the, using language like de-radicalization and extremism, giving China a blank check to basically continue to repress Muslims because of the economic uh, dependency that Muslim countries have on China. So it does come on us, inshallah ta'ala. And by the way, this is where I think activism is important for us to understand that, look, we can't just be, we can't just be loyal to the Democratic Party here. If Marco Rubio is the guy that's going to champion the cause in Congress and say that, you know, China needs to be held accountable for its treatment of the Uyghurs, I'm going to work with Marco Rubio, right? Because that's where, that's, where the, that's where I can benefit my brothers and sisters with this whole thing. Do I think that Pompeo and Rubio are sincere? Uh, well, do I not recognize that there's some economic warfare between the U.S. and China and that critiquing anything about China right now is popular in certain circles of American politics? Yeah, that's true. But I'm going to use that to try to get the best situation and outcome possible for my brothers and sisters that are suffering from the Uyghurs. So I think it's important for us to, to try to utilize what we have and subhanAllah recognize how consequential your voice here in the United States is. I just came from RIS in Canada and they actually had two informants from the from Chinese informants that were walking around the bazaar checking out who was volunteering at the Uyghur booth and who was, the, I mean, it was like crazy, right? And the Uyghurs themselves, a lot of them could not work those booths 
even wear a shirt or work those boots because they feared the repercussions for their families back home if they were caught posting something online or raising their awareness. Those of us who don't have family, and you know, they are our family, of course, brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity that are in those situations, it's on us. It's on us to raise our voice for them, inshallah ta'ala, and to advocate for change and to put pressure on the government, inshallah ta'ala, uh, for that. And then lastly, in terms of du'a being activism, yes, du'a is a form of activism. Uh, du'a is an agent for change. When people talk about thoughts and prayers and they critique it, they're critiquing a very escapist understanding of thoughts and prayers that you know, certain people uh, intend when they use the words like thoughts and prayers. But for us, thoughts, prayers, and actions in our, own, in our own conception are all important inshallah ta'ala. So our dua is important and we should train ourselves to make quotes for people, to stand up and pray for people. Train our children to stand up and make dua for people, that you have a responsibility to make dua for people. That will also emotionally connect you to the people more so that you can do more for them, bibin Allah. Allah khair. Uh, inshallah we'll now break for a song.